Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the most must-listen-to podcast on YouTube. Welcome to... Film Frauds. That is right. My name is Matt, and also joining me are two film aficionados, my, my, my um, second among equals, Tyler, and our special guest who is making a second appearance on Film Frauds, Mark. Hello. How are you guys doing? Doing pretty good. I'm good. wearing a hat. Mm, yeah, good old Boston Red Sox hat. Yep. And Mark's wearing his America shirt. My, yeah, Dog. Dog America, great. We're very nice. patriotic in a movie that's not very patriotic. Mm. So. so today, speaking of good segue, we were talking about The Five Bloods. And so we're going to give our non-spoiler opinions on it first. And then once this discussion necess- necessitates it, we'll go into spoilers. So The Five Bloods is about four African-American vets that battle the forces of man and nature when they return to Vietnam, seeking the remains of their fallen squad leader, and the gold fortune he helped them hide. That was very natural. I, oh, was it? <laughs> very natural, yes. It's like you really? Were okay, good. I was, that was my first time reading from the... I was a little nervous, to be honest. <laughs> I was afraid I was going to uh, flub all the lines. So, Tyler, what did you think of The Five Bloods? Crap, I didn't want to go first. Uh, I, think, <laughs> I think I might be the lowest on this movie. Uh, okay. They, I haven't... This movie's tough. If you look at Rotten Tomatoes, you see that the critics gave it a kind of renowned reviews, or at least for the most part, and audiences really didn't like it, and have never so thoroughly agreed with both sides. I think this is a good but messy movie with a lot with highs that are very, very high and lows that are uncomfortable, awkward, and poorly made. Um, there are okay. times when the movie uh, gives has some of the most magnetic, I think, scenes and performances. But I also think there are times when it's kind of reminiscent of a Hallmark movie, um, which I can get to more details. But I, I do think I was the lowest out of you guys. I think you guys liked it a little bit more than me. Um, I just think it's a really messy movie uh, overall. Okay. I, I can I will go into more specifics, but that's just kind of my quick thoughts. Mark, please tell Tyler why he's wrong. <laughs> well, I think this is like a good movie with a capital G. Um, okay. Yeah. What about a capital O? <laughs> Uh, no, not, that's too far. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, no, I, 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 I liked it. I can see what you're saying, Tyler. There was a lot of moments that were kind of jarring for me. I was like, you know, uh, in the beginning with the, the editing, it was, it was kind of throwing me off, but, uh, overall, I really like this movie. Um, this is the third Spike Lee movie I've seen. The other two being Black Klansman and Do the Right Thing. And, you know, Consistently, Spike Lee has movies that have just great or like very sharp commentary, and I really feel like this this movie had something to say. And like overall, I just I really enjoyed it. Like if I were to give it a ten, it'd probably be like a seven point five eight. So. Yeah, I I probably agree with you more, Mark. I'd say this is a solid eight movie. I think the biggest fault of this movie is that it peaks a little too early. I think the best scene of the movie is about halfway to two thirds of the way through, and it never mm-hmm. really continues that momentum i won't go into spoilers until i won't say what the scene is until we go into spoilers but i think this movie is really well made i think this movie is very relevant to right now and this is the first spike lee movie i've ever seen so and mm-hmm. i'm you know pretty curious to see what what its other movies are like i'm pretty certain they're they cover very similar topics but um i want to talk about the acting and the characters first because i thought that was the strongest part of the movie yep. um, mm-hmm. especially the um, one of the Vietnam soldiers who, whose name I can't remember, but he's the, he's the one that wore the, the MAGA hat. Yep, Paul by he played he was uh, played by Delroy Lindo, who's actually I think British. Is he? I think I think I read somewhere that he's British, which is yeah. even more impressive. So yeah, I, I I completely agree. I just wanted to throw that out there that is Paul. He's he's probably when I said magnetic performance, um, it's very rare when you have kind of a, a good ensemble cast and one guy kind of anytime he speaks, he draws your attention to it. Yeah. He's something kind of akin to like Anthony Hopkins in Silence of the Lambs. When any times he's on screen, is kind of draws you into his performance. It's, I think magnetic is the best word. I probably said that a few times already. Yeah. yeah. So Matt, what else? Keep going with your point, sorry. I was gonna say that um, I think that Paul is, is the best character in the whole movie because he's the one who's suffering the most from PTSD. Yep. Um, and I think that his, his character is both extremely hostile, but also somewhat sympathetic at the same time, yep. both, both in how like the audience sees him and how he responds to the other characters. Mm-hmm. And I just saw that all, like all four of the leads, all five of the leads had um, really great chemistry. And I thought that what carried me through the movie was like my concern 
for seeing the character survive to the end. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, Mark, do you want to? You wanna yeah, yeah. I thought uh, Delroy Lindo as Paul was fa- fantastic. And there's some uh, great standout scenes towards the end with him. Um, I also like Chadwick Boseman and his very limited yes. uh, but powerful performance. Mm. Um, even though he was on screen for, you know, not a whole lot of time, I, I really got a gist of his character and I uh, just wanted to hear more from him and him to hear what he had to say. He's but, good uh, when he's playing a character. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. Uh, I, I completely agree. I, I think this is a movie carried by uh, performances and uh, the chemistry between leads. Uh, yeah. You, there's, a, there's clearly evidence of history, which I think Spike Lee captures really well. From the first, from the one of the very first scenes of people, because we should preface this movie's uh, uh, is incredibly political. Mark, you mentioned that, mm-hmm. but it's not political in just in its themes and its ideas, but it also contains a lot of actual historical videos and pictures that kind of tie in and add kind of uh, backing to the mm-hmm. to the argument Spike Lee is making. So oftentimes, characters will mention a person, and you'll see that person on screen in an actual picture. Um, the first few minutes of the movie is kind of putting the actual characters in the world into context, which I really liked. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, in terms of kind of I- ideas, it's all, it's all, sorry, I was, I was going to say the opening scene where we first meet characters very much sells their history. Uh, mm-hmm. I-, I-, I think immediately the chemistry is great. And I think this is a movie carried by their performances. So that's that. Yeah. Did you, did you mind like the, the cutting back and forth? Well, I'm asking this to the both of you. Did, like, did you find like the cutting back and forth between like real life pictures and real life videos to back to like the, the movie to be distracting? Do you think it fit well with the movie? Do you think it was necessary? I think uh, I, I liked it. It really, yeah. you know, they're like, they're, you know, he's throwing punches at you, Spike. Yeah. And um, it was really like hone it in yeah. and really sort of give you the necessary context uh, to what, you know, people experienced. And, you know, he, you know, there's there's the en- there's enemies in this movie. Like they're facing uh, enemies, and Spike doesn't make them like one dimensional. Yeah, he, he's like you know, uh, backing them up with uh, pictures and evidence to yes. support their anger. And yeah. so it really, really hits you hard when yeah. he when he when he drops those images on you. So I like them. Yes, I uh... I agree. I like them too. Um, I saw like. A lot of complaints from other reviewers saying that the editing i think when, when they're referring to the editing and the editing they're referring to the transitions between real life videos and pictures and then back to like the movie but it didn't i actually liked it i thought it, it added more um like historical relevance to the to what we were seeing and yeah it didn't mm-hmm. really bother me either and i mm-hmm. actually think it helped uh, enhance the movie yeah, I uh, I think editing is a really good part of this movie. I, I think there are little touches. Oftentimes when characters are embracing, you yeah. see the action a few times. I, I think that really sells kind of the movement of it. Mm. or Not the movement of it, but the, the intention behind it. Apparently that's a thing Spike Lee does in other movies where characters will often, like the same movement will be kind of replicated. And I, I mm. honestly enjoyed that. In terms of kind of the inserts, I think there was only really one that I felt like they could have done without. And it's it's during a scene, uh, the I think probably the best scene of the movie, where I, I think uh, you, where you are, you're also in the middle. It's it's given during the middle of kind of a character doing really good acting, I think to put it in like very simply, yeah. um, kind of giving a really great performance. And I, I think cutting away with that slightly ruined the, the kind of involvement in the scene, the engagement with the scene. Uh, other than that, uh, I think the end, inclusions that are horribly graphic very tough to watch are, are really great because i think mark brings it up because it starts to humanize both sides of the conflict at the end of the movie because up until that point i, I thought it was a little kind of iffy on what was going on with the the enemies uh, at the end uh, mm-hmm. but other than that I, I think adding historical context like you guys both said is important i only think there's one instance uh where it was a little kind of intrusive onto what was yeah. happening in the movie mm-hmm. or uh, unnecessary i, I think might yeah. be a better word but uh, yeah, I, I think there's really great editing. I, I like the switching of aspect ratios from normal to 4.3. Um, I, I liked how when they were recording video uh, during modern times, the video was recorded in 4.3. Kind of ties into a lot of themes that are present throughout the movie. Mm-hmm. Kind of how war persists in past and present. Uh, I yeah. thought that was really cool. So I, I really honestly, I, I did read a lot of complaints that people didn't like the editing and I thought it was pretty good. 
So I feel like um, we're speaking very vaguely about the movie, um, <laughs> and I kind of want to get into spoilers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I think uh, before we cut to spoilers, yeah. anybody who's listening and who hasn't uh, seen the movie yet, uh, just a fair warning, there's you know some graphic images of war yes. uh, in fair. this movie that will come out of nowhere. Or yeah. well, it doesn't really exactly come out of nowhere, but uh, it can be a bit jarring, so you've been warned. Yeah. yeah. This is also a very, it's 150 minutes long, and it is a long movie. So it's mm-hmm. on Netflix, like Mark said. It's not the easiest watch ever. It's also, I, I don't, this is also very politically relevant. I, I know that I don't think, I think this is the best timing for a movie that has ever existed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I, I can't believe, kind of with all the Black Lives Matter protests going on, the movie came out. It came out at the best possible time. I was blown away by that, because there's no way they had ever, that's not a, Thing you can plant i don't know i thought that was really cool so yeah uh, spike's other film do the right thing um that movie it came out in 1989 yep. and it's still shocking how relevant it is like it is even more relevant this movie's relevant this yeah do the right thing is like even more relevant yep. now so yeah it's funny I, that you say relevance because this movie has um two two like the stars from the wire in it Two, mm-hmm. two of the two, two of the um, Vietnam veteran leads are both from The Wire, and like The Wire, I would say is like an extremely relevant TV show still to this day, even though it, it was filming like 15 years ago. So like all these, it was just funny like how like all these, you know, actors and and writers and directors all came together and made this you know really great movie. Yep. Uh, so I feel like we can give our final thoughts before spoilers. Uh, yeah. I, I I do think I'm the lowest on that. Um, we we also didn't mention that this is an action movie. Um, kind of kind of yeah uh, and i should preface i don't like the action movie part of it uh, mm. I, I think that's a big downfall for it for me i think there's a much more engaging story in this without the need for kind of a violent resolution if that makes sense i will get we'll get into more specifics mm. but I, I i thought with the latter hour 45 minutes to an hour of the movie being centered around action points I really didn't like it at that point. Uh, mm-hmm. So that that was a big, I should preface, that messy being um, that I, I think there's a great movie in here, but mm-hmm. I think the, the movie does a lot, and I think some of the stuff doesn't work, necessarily the action points, when we have a movie so grounded in kind of reality. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's another thing, these tonal shifts. Uh, there's an example I wanted to give. I, I, tonal shifts work in a world where the tonal shifts aren't too drastic, not out of the believable world, I think one of the best ones that does it is Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. Um, that movie at the beginning before, spoilers for that, before Woody Harrelson's revealed to have cancer, the, the movie's kind of treated a little bit. Nice, nice warning. Oh, it's it's, it's, <laughs> it's fine. I haven't seen it. <laughs> oh, wait. Oh, no. It. <laughs> I'll forget uh, it by the time I see it. So Okay. Uh, sorry. Um, no, just continue. Mark's looking at his, his movie watching calendar, and it's like three <laughs> years from now. So he's like, I'll I forget had, about it by then. I had, I had Phantom Thread spoiled for me last night. So, oh, oh really? Oops. Yeah, that's all. Uh, that's moved down the list now. Oops. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, my bad. But tonal shifts uh, have to exist within the kind of the context of the world. Three Billboards does it really well. Um, I don't know if The Five Bloods does it really well for the story they're trying to tell. Mm. Um, I think the jarring tonal shift from character study of post-war PTSD to shoot him up action movie, I didn't really like it that much. That's the whole point. That was the whole roundabout way to say I'm not a yeah, big fan of the action Yeah, that was convoluted. I, it's well-filmed. It's well-made. I just wasn't a fan of it in the movie. And I, okay. I, I think that adds to why people are so kind of hit or miss on this movie. Uh, there's a lot people just aren't going to connect with, and that's one of them for me. So, So... so- if you were if you were to give it a score, what would you give it? It's, How many schmoes? Uh, How many schmoes? <laughs> it fall. It's there's a lot to love about this movie, and I do want to preface that it's 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 like a three and a half out of five movie kind of for me. Yeah, that's it's, fair. It's not. It's nowhere near a bad movie, but there are just certain elements of it that I think take away from the story at hand, and that's it. Yeah, I'll just give my last opinions on the movie before you go into spoilers. Um, I would say it's a solid four out of five stars. I think that it has more flaws than a movie I would normally give four out of five stars, but um, some of the, like, um, like I was very emotionally attached to some of the scenes more than I have been in in recent movies for a long time. So I think that kind of elevates and that kind of um, corrects some of, like, the wrongdoings I think the movie makes. And I think that um, this movie is worth seeing for anyone, really, who is um, interested in um, 
racial history of the U.S., interested in history in general, interested in Spike Lee movies, I'd say just check it out. Yeah. Yeah. And with that, we're going to spoilers. Hey, 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 I, didn't, I didn't go. <laughs> you kind of went. I like, went to you first. All right. Well, I did. Still. All right. Fine, 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 fine. Spoiler <laughs> time. Let's do it. Okay. Right. So, Mark, I was going to go to you first because you said you had some fiery. What? Spoiler, yeah, I'm just spoilers. Spo- one more. Spoiler. <laughs> spoilers. All right, Mark. Go back. Go. Okay. Uh, let's see. Let's talk about things I liked. Mark, yeah, you, you said you had some fiery hot takes in this movie. I was really excited. I didn't say I had fiery, fiery hot takes. I just said I had things to say. Um, I translated that as fiery hot takes. <laughs> yeah. um, I want to talk about the characters. So, like, Delroy Lindo as Paul. I thought that was great and yeah. very well fleshed out. I thought, like, uh, you know, for the most part, all the characters in the movie are pretty well fleshed out. Uh, minus, I'd say, like, the tour guide. Um, yeah. I, I felt like he was too nice. I was ready for a backstabbing mm. at like every point in the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, and he just was very convenient to them during, for the plot. And that kind of took me out of it a little bit. Um, yeah. I would say like the rich, the rich guy was very French, underdeveloped too. Yeah. No, the red, like the rich, but you're not like the, the veteran who we're in spoilers now. Yeah. yeah. So like the, the one who says he's rich at the beginning of the movie, but then it turns out that he's broke. Oh, Eddie. Eddie. No. Yeah. Uh, like oh, he, yeah, yeah. they kind of like yeah. they kind of um, they kind of like condensed his his whole story into like yeah. the three minutes before he dies. Yeah. yeah. So but, I would say out of like the main characters, I I feel like he was the one who was the least developed, and I kind of it was a little jarring to me because all the other characters felt more well realized to me. Yeah. Yeah. I. So for me, I, I felt like the uh, some characterizations were forced and some weren't. Uh, I felt like the. Um, What's the the guy who survives at the end of the of the Bloods? Is it Otis? Uh, Otis, yeah. Otis. Yeah, Otis, who plays Lester in The Liar. Oh. Uh, I wasn't exactly invested in his own story. I, if it didn't, maybe things were flying over my head, but it didn't really feel completely relevant to the plot. I feel like they're just grounding him for the sake of grounding him. That's what I agree. Um, I agree with that. Um, and as well as Eddie, as you said, Matt, uh, it sort of came out of left field with his confession. And then there was no consequence of it. I mean, from what his actions were. Then, but I know he yeah. gets blown up by a landmine. Um, but I guess, yeah. I guess, like his role, I guess, would be that despite having no, like, because when they all get the gold, um, all three, the other veterans say, "Oh, we're gonna keep this money to ourselves." And then, there, then Eddie is like, "But um, Cadwick Bozeman said, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> whatever yeah. that Storm this is for, this is for like um, African Americans." This is or, or this is for African Americans. This is where the money's going to go to, and they're like, they're like, you're you're richer, you're richer than God. Like, what do you care? Like, we like we need this money more than you. He's like, no, I'm broke, and I'm still giving all this money to to them. So I think yeah. that's like his purpose is to be the motivation for them to give the money away to so keep yeah. it for themselves. But I still like your your point is still valid that he's underdeveloped amongst mm-hmm. the rest of them. I I honestly didn't have a problem with Otis. I thought that he had enough development with like his with like the girl that might be his daughter or whatever. Yeah, right, right. Um, so there's like enough. Um, I liked the like kind of like the huskier guy, the most. Oh yeah, I don't know. Mel, his name. Uh, Melvin. 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 Wow, look at Tyler. That was all the names. I know. I, uh, I, made, I made sure this. I honestly, there's a point where all the characters are being introduced, and I went on IMDb and I made sure I knew all their names because things were going yeah. really fast at the beginning. I was like, oh. I think behind your camera, Tyler, you wrote their names all in humongous letters and sharpened yeah. on your wall. I did actually I write their names right here. Oh, there it is. <laughs> uh, no, I. Uh, yeah, Melvin. See this movie, I, I agree with the, the whole idea that Otis, I, I think there are a few plots that are kind of in there that I don't think are necessary. Um, but this is a movie very heavily guided by themes. Um, yeah. So a lot of the times, parts that seem unnecessary are, are mainly just to kind of fuel a theme. And a part of this is the uh, the people, the lamb people, the uh, the the guy who, uh, Paul's son, David? Yeah. Who meets yeah, yeah. and kind of, they form the relationship and their whole character, I thought they were completely unnecessary but the point of their theme the, a big theme about this is the the kind of the uh, the outreach of war and the impact that war can have you see it a lot with the characters you see it with the vietnamese people themselves and another part is people kind of crying in to come help to kind of clean up this mess of war and it, it's a whole the whole point of the movie is to show the lasting impacts of war because their whole thing is uh removing landmines from so people basically don't kill themselves stepping on them from battlefields yeah. um and while I thought they didn't add a lot to the movie, I understand their importance, but it's still you still have to judge this off of their a movie itself. And I, I thought ultimately they kind of just kind of padded the runtime a little bit and didn't really add a lot to me. 
Um, I did like all the characters. Spike Lee, I, I'm not too versed on Spike Lee, but I don't. He doesn't have any subtlety. I, um, subtlety is not really a thing in this movie. Um, I think that's or, one of his strengths. Really? Yeah. Well, I I have some opinions that I think he's trying to make subtly that um I could be wrong about. But yeah, I thought there was some subtlety in it. But we can get into like my thoughts after but, you're done with your point. It might not be subtle. It might be more like attempts at foreshadowing that are very very obvious. Um, there there's the whole point where you're kind of waiting for a landmine to explode. As soon as Lamb is introduced oh, and the whole yeah. threat of landmines, anytime the metal detector goes off or David the ding or they basically try to put up gold you're kind of waiting for someone to step on it and blow up uh ultimately right. it does become eddie because there are a lot of times they have a lot of action movie shots where someone is kind of framed in the the front of the camera whatever like the foreground back front ground, whatever it's called um or they, or they go off in the foreground and it's kind of focused on them but it's a stagnant shot so you can get kind of the whole thing yeah it happens with david a few times uh when he starts digging up stuff and you're kind of like i'm kind of waiting for something to happen um, I didn't think it'd be that type of movie, uh, but once Eddie steps on it, and you're like, okay, it didn't really have that impact because I think Spike very heavily telegraphs it's going to happen. Yeah. I also think um, Paul killing Norman. Um, I I believe you're. I feel like you're supposed to understand that he. Um, but Norman he, is oh uh, Storm and Norman yeah, yeah Storm yeah. And Norman. I think <laughs> I, I think you're supposed to based on Paul's grief that he that he killed him, um, and then the reveal is that he accidentally killed him. Yeah, um, I, I, I'm not really sure if that's supposed to be purposeful or that was just something that was very glaringly obvious. Um, I don't know. Those are just like foreshadowed. Melvin at one point says he would never jump on a live grenade. He jumps on a live grenade at the end of the movie and sacrifices himself. I mean, foreshadowing is not really foreshadowing is good when it falls into the background and you don't really notice it. I, I, it felt really heavy handed here for me, and that was a kind of a big takeaway for me. That's yeah, funny. So, oh, you go, Mark. Oh, yeah. I just before you got into your points, Matt, there's one thing I wanted to, to bring up um, was the the aspect ratio changing. I I really liked uh, the use of that to show you, you know, when there was a flashback happening, even though it was already evident what was going on on the screen. Because um, there was moments where it just, the I don't know what the widescreen uh, 16 by 9 16 by 9 to the to, to the 4 by 3 it just slowly transfers into the 4 by 3 I just thought that was a cool filmmaking technique I guess it's not even a technique it's just a editing technique but uh, yeah I really like that how about you guys I liked it um, the flashbacks were problematic to me because they decided to use the same 60 70 year old actors in the yeah. flashbacks that they did in, in the in the um, in the real time so, like, you have young Chadwick Boseman running around with guys that are, you know, clearly way older. And they don't really do much of an attempt to hide their faces, too. So, like, you just think – so, they, they look exactly the same they did, sixty what? like, within 60 years. Well, here's how I interpreted that was um, – I disagree with that. Uh, I, I, a lot of, I see a lot of people on, like, you know, IMDb and Rotten Tomatoes that this bothered them. I thought it was, you know, to show that this memory that they all have mm. was, like, still haunting them to this day. You know, they still place themselves in that memory. That's why they're still older when you see the flashback. Yep. I mean, that's how I interpreted it. Okay. So that's that's why it, it didn't really bother me. Mm. Yeah, um, I, I, but yeah, I agree. That, that, that firefight in, the, in one of the first flashbacks, I felt like that scene really overstayed its welcome. It was way too long. I totally uh, agree. I was yeah. like, why is this scene still going on? Yeah. It yeah. was just it was just cut to them running to different areas and yeah. then shooting. And then they cut to the Viet Cong guys and they die. And then yeah. you get no real scale of how many guys they're fighting or anything. Mm -hmm. It was yeah, I totally agree with that. That that scene was way too long. Mm -hmm. That's uh that's kind of a problem. I, I do really want to talk about the action in this movie. It's well filmed, it's well directed, yeah. but I don't think – this movie's weird. It's not really – at least from the trailers or the movies you go in, you expect a lot of the action to be relegated to the flashbacks, which I agree with the memory part. Uh, it's just these characters kind of reliving. And, I mean, Chadwick Boseman is the same age because I, I feel like that's when he, at the age when he died, um, and they're kind of reliving these memories and placing themselves. I thought it was a nice way to put them and kind of put the characters where they were. Um, I, I, I actually enjoyed that. But this movie is very weird in the tonal shifts with the action. There's also seems to be weird conflicting messages because they do a lot of times to go, hey, the Vietnamese guys, Vietnamese guys, um, 
they're not just mindless goons to kill. Look, they have a claim to this gold at the end. They have a clear purpose. They are not just bad guys. But then it resorts to just mindlessly killing them like bad guys. This is like this is like my whole this is like my whole subtlety thing this that I wanted to talk thing? about. I I just I also like again, there is a really, really engaging story in here as one character struggles clearly with immense PTSD. Um, but also kind of these four kind of characters reuniting, exploring their past, you know, gathering the gold. I, I like that part and kind of reliving with getting uh, Storm and Norman's remains. There was a really, really engaging movie with that. I think you could have had the climax of the movie or the big bad scene in the movie be the landmine scene where Eddie dies and jo- uh, David steps on a landmine. I think, perfect. It's the best scene in the movie. But then there's another hour after that where they st- – where these people will start killing Vietnamese soldiers, or it turns into an action movie, and it didn't work for me. Okay, so this is what I this is what I think. Okay. So obviously, this movie, like the core theme, of this movie is racism, obviously. Yeah. Um, and there's like the the clear um, criticism of how um, African Americans are treated in America, with yep. especially r- with um, the Vietnamese War, and how the the minorities only make up 11 percent of the population, but 37 percent of Aver- but 30 but the Thirty-seven percent of the U.S. Army is of African Americans. They bring that up in the radio. So, and I think that what Spike Lee is trying to show is um, the difference and the similarities between between um, domestic racism and foreign racism. And I think the whole point of the flashback to where um, Cad- to where um, Storm and Norman is guiding them through like the the tall grass, and they listen to the to the Vietnamese guys have a conversation that. And like they're like, oh, like we're just normal people. Like, oh, I'm gonna write my girlfriend a poem or whatever. I think that's what they mm-hmm. said. And that, he's like, I'm gonna dialogue. kiss my girlfriend, and then he gets obliterated. Yeah. and then then they get annihilated. Yeah. And I think I think that that is supposed to be another um, criticism of like sub of subconscious or unconscious racism because they don't mm-hmm. even take a second to think like, oh, maybe these are other people. Like they are just viewed as the enemy. And I think that. Um, and then towards the end, when they when they get the gold, and then the other Vietnamese people come, and they're like, "This is our gold. You murdered our people." And then having the the the, the veterans undermine their claim and their history is this another is this another form of how racism both exists, um, uh, both domestically and you know in war as well, and how they're kind of conditioned in, into thinking into viewing the enemy as this one dimensional cl- um, being. That's how I see it. But do we, but do we yeah. need all that with the shoot 'em up action? Couldn't we have kind of Well, that's the point Roberts. of the shoot 'em up action is is, yeah. like, is is to show that they aren't is to show that they're not viewing these people as humans. I feel like we could have accomplished that without mindlessly killing the bo- I don't but know. But you cr- you criticize them for not being subtle enough and then I think I think this is a very subtle I, yeah. message and I, yeah. I don't know I think I personally think it was done perfectly. If I'm interpreting it right, I think it was done perfectly. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I mean I can again. This is a movie that I, if anyone Five out of five, I understand. One out of five, I understand. There's a lot to kind of absorb with this movie and a lot that I think people are going to love and not love. Mark, mm-hmm. am I talking crazy or do you agree with me? This no, Matt, I, I, I pretty much agree with you. I think you're on the nose there. Okay. Um, sorry, Tyler. That's all right. <laughs> this is the second podcast in a row. Where I, <laughs> called out on. I know. God, Mark, you're never coming back. Oh, crap. <laughs> well, all right. So um, is it right if I, if I uh, pivot to a different – point go for it I have, I, have, I have a few things that i want to talk about um so did you guys feel that at times the the, the music was a bit distracting yes okay that's one of my hallmark points there is one of the best uses of a song in here with marvin gaye's isolated vocals for what's going on but mm-hmm. then there are times where they're having dialogues and there's hallmark movie in the back hallmark music movie music in the background and it is so distracting. I had to rewatch two scenes because anytime they were having a serious conversation, you can hear like the do 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 do. It's still like like light jazz in the background. It was really really weird. Yeah. I don't know what was happening. Yeah. Um, one instance that uh, was confusing for me is when um, they're using the metal detector to find the gold, and you're expecting a landmine. You got this like cheery, happy-go-lucky music playing over it. So like, I'm expecting a landmine, but you're telling me to be, you know, cheery about it. So I'm, I was like, in this really weird situation where I was just very, very confused, and I wasn't exactly sure how to feel. <laughs> like, is this supposed to be a tense moment or like a complete victory? And, um, yeah. 
And I want that to segue into my next. Oh wait, Matt, do you have a? Do you have a? Yeah, Matt, what do you think about the music? Oh, are... I didn't mind it. I don't know. It didn't, oh, really my... didn't, didn't come up. Okay. So, I, don't have um, any, I don't have any. I don't have any hot takes on the music. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, another thing for me was um, two big coincidences happened mm. in this movie. Uh, the first one is the finding of the gold. Um, you know yeah. when the sun goes off and he just happens to hit on a on a piece of gold. Yep. They had they had yeah. like the metal detector though. Like they would. I know, it. but like. Well, he you did know. run off a little bit, go take a dump, and then happened to take a dump right on. I feel like that's just a little plot hole. That one didn't really bother me, but I get it. Okay. Um, what about uh, for me when um, – what's the, what's the son's name? I can't remember. David. 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 When David stands on, on the landmine yeah. and then the French people show up, like, instantly yeah. to, to save him. Um. I just feel like that was a huge coincidence. Uh, well, that's, like, that's my favorite scene of the whole movie. And that's, it's, like, a great, it's a great scene. Yeah. yeah. But I thought, like, I, like, I don't think it's as simple as, oh, they come to help him. Like, mm-hmm. at first, like, they cause more tension because um, the father doesn't know, like, what they're about. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. like, he, like, they're, they're kind of, like, they're kind of causing problems at first. And they don't, they don't even really do anything to help. Yeah. Like, they, remember, they well, say they what we the do, road. and they go, they well, hope, the well, get off of it and hope it doesn't go off. Yeah. And then it's up to the, to the soldier just to, like, wrap the rope around him and pull him away. Can we talk about that scene, like, in detail? There's a lot. Okay, first off, uh, I mentioned the inserts. That was the one time I thought it was a little unnecessary, mainly because the movie is also a big kind of father-son relationship between yeah. Paul and David. And there's the point where David is on the mine, and Paul is there. The camera's close to them. It's on the side, and you can see because Delroy Lindo is an amazing actor. You can see the emotion on his face. He's sweating. He's clearly really freaked out. Mm. He's just pointing, and he's talking, and he's like, do you remember this? And he, I think he gives an Olympic sprinter. And then it, it cuts away for a few seconds. Oh, yeah. And then it's like, and why? It comes, well, it's like one of those things where it's like you're having an incredible performance, a heart-to-heart moment. This is not a time to cut away. Yeah. This, 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 this point right now, he just has to say it, and we understand the historical context. But I feel like that was a trend Spike Lee was doing, and he's like, oh, I can continue it here. It doesn't it's, – it's like three seconds. But mm. it kind of is one of those things where it, it quickly disengages you from the scene. You're like, oh, well, uh, and then it comes back, and you're back in. That was the one time I thought it felt unnecessary. Mm-hmm. But there's also, and this is where the big tunnel ship happens, is Eddie, he, he walks away and he's in the foreground, and you're like, he's probably going to blow up on a mine. And he blows up on a mine, and he's just like, um, just horribly mutilated. And it was really messed up, and I was really into it. And then the movie completely shifts and becomes the action movie that I wasn't really a big fan of. Mm-hmm. I don't know, what do you guys think about that scene? Because I feel like that's what everyone is going to talk about. I thought it, I I didn't really pick up on that that cut that you guys were talking about. Um, I did pick up on some cuts earlier in the movie that sort of disengaged me, but uh, overall for that scene, uh, I really uh, really enjoyed it. Uh, I don't know. What about you, Matt? <laughs> uh, about the scene? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's my favorite scene of the whole movie. Um, uh-huh. Like like I think like the heart of the movie is the father son relationship and how um, the um, what's what's the the older guy's name? Uh, Paul. Paul has like this really hard exterior, but you know, deep down, it's like the first real time you, you see that he cares, like yep. his son is mm-hmm. most important thing to him. And then because um, the other guy blows up and like, you know, like now, you know, like what's going to happen as soon as he lifts his, as soon as he lifts his yep. foot off is he's going to mm. suffer like another horrible fate, like that older guy. Yeah. And I don't know, that scene was so intense. And then it just keeps escalating. Like first the, the mind blows up and the guy's like, you know, split in half or whatever. Yeah. And then, then you hear the click, and then David is now standing on another mine. Yeah. And then the germ, then the the bomb guys come, and then it causes um, uh, Paul to have a PTSD attack. And then yeah. he like he somehow gets it all together enough to think of a plan. They tie the rope around him. I don't know. I thought that scene was brilliant. And but to the to the to the movie's discredit now, I thought that movie was like the peak. My peak investment of the, of the movie was that scene, and it mm-hmm. never really got to that same height again for me yeah. it's an hour and a half in yeah and you have an hour left and that's the best mm-hmm. scene of the movie it's also again i feel like i feel like that scene is also a perfect vehicle for a lot of for at least paul to well paul's an interesting character because paul um never with with his group of uh bloods he, he eventually leaves the group at the end of the movie that's that's kind of jumping ahead but his whole character arc is kind of self-acceptance rather than kind of his self-acceptance, not with his own kind of sh- struggles in war, PTSD and stuff like that, but his acceptance over uh, Norman's death. That, that's his whole character arc. I feel like that right there uh, could have served as a vehicle to tackle kind of other maybe post-war 
kind of traumas, but instead it, it well, it's probably more realistic look rather, um, where it kind of doubles down. He gets control of the gun and then he's kind of in charge. He's like, I'm controlled now. It's, it's an interesting scene, uh, but you're right. The climax happening, the best scene in the movie rather happening an hour and a half in is a little troublesome. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I, I feel like we should also talk about necessarily, uh, Paul after he leaves the group or just kind of Paul's scenes. Mm -hmm. Um, I personally kind of, I do like what we got, but I personally would have really loved if he wandered into the woods and we heard him yelling and that was the last we saw of him. Um, and maybe his mm -hmm. kind of redemption with Storm and Norman happens a little bit. He kind of has that acceptance, but then the, the blood's kind of not really necessary. Like that, what happens happens is they split apart. He, I would have loved that that was the end of him. Mm -hmm. Never saw him again. I don't know. That's just me. What'd you guys think? Or what'd you guys think of his character arc rather? Um, that's a that's a good point. I think if he just sort of wandered off and that was the end of it, uh, after he had sort of that resolution, that'd have been neat. Um, but once he wanders off, like in the movie, and um, and has sort of his fever dream, uh, I really enjoyed all those sequences, especially when he's uh just talking directly into the camera and mm -hmm. it's just tracking him, and you get these like. I think it's like at least a minute to two minute long shots of him just sort of monologuing. Um, I thought it was phenomenal, you know, phenomenal performance by uh, Delroy Lindo. Um, and then his like sort of fever dream with uh, Storm and Norman, you know, that was great. And, you know, Chad, Chadwick was great. And uh, I was very uh, content with the way his arc sort of finished. Um, so what about you, Matt? Um, I was content with the way the arc was finished. I thought that after he ran into the jungle, it, like his arc kind of got a little muddy to me. Like I wasn't really sure what was going on. Mm -hmm. um, but I think like the real cathart the real cathartic moment we had with the characters when was the the landmine scene where he says he actually loves the sun. Mm -hmm. And I didn't I didn't really feel like the same um, like um, satisfying feeling I got from when he's you know get, get, when he gets the forgiveness from uh, from Storm and Norman like. I thought it was a good scene, but I thought like the real like um, climax of his character arc came with the landmine scene. What about uh, when the son reads the letter at the end? Oh yeah, there was that, but that that more has to do with um, like that has that really has nothing to do with the um, Stormer Norman stuff. That that's, yeah, that's that still true. ties along with yeah. the, with the landmine stuff. What do you guys like? That would be a nice like um, that'd be a nice ending, regardless. Like I think that even if the Chadwick Boseman stuff was um, out of the movie, that the lighter scene was still fit in perfectly fine. Probably even mm -hmm. better. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you guys think of the movie killing some of the Bloods in the way that they did? Because there's also this weird hesitancies from Spike Lee to kind of mourn these characters a lot. I mean, Eddie dies, and then he has kind of like, he has his moment where he says his final words. Melvin dies on a grenade, and that's basically it. The movie ends. We never really talk about him. Kind of get a little bit at the end where you see the money donates to his family. I I, I know, um, I think Eddie says that like when the bloods die, like they just regrow. That's kind of shown at the end when the donations are given to the Black Lives Matter movement and Melvin's family's getting, everyone's getting money. It, it goes with the theme of it. But I thought the movie was weird and how it, it kind of unceremoniously killed off its main characters. Mm -hmm. Um I, what do you guys think about that? Because, it, again, it was really jarring. Because Melvin, I think Melvin was probably the most jarring to me. Because he's, yep. again, he jumps on a grenade, he dies. It's and foreshadowing. It. And then that's it. And then he basically, there's not really a mention of him again. I know it's towards the end of the movie. But we just spent, two, I think it was probably two hours and 20 minutes with him at this point. Yep. I don't, I don't know. What do you guys think about that? Yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, I feel like, I mean, Eddie is, you know, he's gone. And then you sort of get that resolution after his death and you know there's a there's a little time to mourn um paul is given uh you know plenty of time to see his arc to the end and then melvin is he's just you know when he was gone i was like so you know i mean i was sad and uh but you have like you know the movie gives you no time to really mourn about it except for like that one scene at the end with his family um so yeah that's those are my thoughts matt um, so I, I love abrupt and unexpected deaths. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> it's funny because like, 
I, I write a little bit. And when Tyler read one of my short stories, he criticized the fact that I kill a lot of characters off really quickly without much mm-hmm. consequence. So yeah. like, I really like it when characters just die instantly. Yeah. It just feels more realistic to me. I don't know. And especially because it's a war movie. It's like, in in and and you know i haven't been in real war but i know in real war like people don't have the emotional going out um like take mm-hmm. take take as many of the fastest with you as you can moment like people just die and then it's like oh but we're still in danger so like why would we take this moment to mourn when our laps are still up still in the line i don't know it worked for me it um i didn't feel like it was abrupt or um unceremonious like i like those kind of deaths that's the george r, r. martin in you yeah it yeah. is a george r. r martin in me i just <laughs> And it's kind of Martin McDonough in a way, too, because Martin McDonough has a ton of just abrupt deaths. It's like... I've only seen in Bruges, so... Oh, yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the Martin McDonough spoiler cast for, uh, <laughs> for Mark. <laughs> but, like, I've read his... Po- like, I'm talking about his po- about his plays and stuff, too, because I read all those as well. But mm-hmm. No one assumed you were talking about his plays, so they're just like, oh, crap. They're like, oh, damn. Except for that uh, one person. Like, oh, yeah. No, that, that's... Plays. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, was very, I was very surprised by the death of... Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, Come on, he's got. I can't think of a single um of the mom and um. I can't think of a single McDonald play right now. I read like ten of them. <laughs> Take your time. Take your time. No, we're not taking that. Yo, we have to live in the shame. Back to me. Get back to me. <laughs> he has. He's to live in his shame now. No, I don't know. That was like a big part of the tonal shift. I, like I, I get what you're saying, but it also didn't like their deaths exist. You need to clean up Lenane. There you go. Oh, there you, you go. You did it. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah no, th- th- their deaths exist. That Those style of deaths exist in a movie that is in current war. And I know I, I, I mentioned this earlier, and I, my point might contradict it, but how war persists. But the movie we got is not characters in an active state of war. It's dealing with the effects of war. And Eddie's son, I don't know. I, I It was just, it's not a bad thing either. I just, it's just, it's, kind of, it's very jarring. I but like the war, the war, like that, the, the theme of the war continues is, is consistent because the war is, has never left their brains. Yes, but, yeah. but, but we're, that's, that's the what's it called? psychological side that I want to tackle more. Instead, yeah. we just got Eddie blowing up, which again, great scene. And then I, also the villagers who are upset about the, the massacre of the children are still yeah. holding that grudge. Yeah, but I don't know. There's a lot to work out with this. <laughs> I was like, my point is... Is right. <laughs> My point is right somehow. No, no, no. I just thought it was a little jarring. And, and again, there, it's very, it's very rare when you find a movie that I, I think because there's there's certain movies like Matt. We talked about The Handmaiden and The Wrestler. I feel like those are unequivocally good movies. Um, I feel like masterpieces, if, someone, if you will. What masterpieces? If Master- you will. <laughs> but the thing is, like, if someone went with The Wrestler's like a really bad movie, The Handmaiden, it's like it's like okay. But if someone came here and went, yeah, The Five Bloods isn't a really good movie. I don't like it that much. I understand it. But I also understand when someone says five out of five, best movie of the year, super great. I, I get it. It's a weird, weird one of those movies. Mm-hmm. Like my Man of Steel. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you like you like obvious use of imagery. Yeah, Chuck. yeah, yeah. It's got to be spelt out for you. Where people where where Zod says, "I was born in pain and suffering, and now I will kill everyone." Tyler goes, "He was born in pain and suffering. That's why he's gonna kill everyone." <laughs> Welcome to our Man of Steel podcast, everyone. Yeah. I love Man yeah. of Steel. I ended up defend, defending this movie way more than I thought. It's because it's I was... T- I don't know. Like, Do you guys have any final thoughts about it? Like, Any final complaints? Uh, compliments? Anything you like? didn't like? I, this is a movie that I will want to see again. That's usually my measure of, yeah. you know, is this a good movie or not? Will I want to see it again? Yes? Okay, it's good. Yeah. Yeah. This movie makes me want to watch more Spike Lee movies. So. Yeah. Yes, please watch yeah. Do the Right Thing. I, mm-hmm. Also, uh, on Netflix, there's Malcolm X. Uh, yeah, she's well, got it's like three it. and a half hours long. So. And, school, <laughs> and School Days. There's three on Netflix. Oh, okay. Speaking of three and a half hours long, what did you guys think of the runtime and the pace of this movie? Did it ever uh, come out? Was I it felt ever an it. issue? You felt yeah, it? It, felt, it felt its length. Yeah. Is, it, is um, it because of the content of it? Or is it because the movie's just long? Because heavy movies like that, you feel its length because the content kind of bears down you. Yeah. I mean, there's a point we should preface that one of the really harsh things is you see like a, ch- a young child's face blown apart. It's really graphic. You see a bunch of dead kids and it's really tough to watch, but that's also two hours and 10 minutes into the movie. Yeah. And you've kind of been numbed by that point. And that I think, kind of stuff oh. adds sorry, to the emotional kind of like toll it takes. Like this movie, you have to kind of plan your day around. Yeah. All right, tonight mm. I'm going to watch Well, this movie compares to, I'm going to compare this movie to Apocalypse Now, which is like three hours long. If you watch the Redux edition, 
And that movie is a lot and it's overbearing, but it also goes by really quickly because it's a fantastic movie. Yeah. I think that what makes this movie feel its length for me is what we've been saying all along is that the movie peaks too early with the landmine scene. And then the next hour is you trying to figure out like what's, you trying to feel that same emotional um, connection or that you had with that one scene. And it doesn't never really achieves that. And I think that you just get confused because you're, because at least I was feeling confused because it's like you're trying to figure out where this movie's going after like such a great scene and never, and you're kind of expecting it to like crescendo again, but it never truly does to the way and like the, to the magnitude it does early mm-hmm. on. Yeah. I don't, I, I, I kind of agree. There's a certain point where you're kind of like, okay, is it almost over and you have 45 minutes left? Uh, yeah. I don't, I, yeah. It was definitely was one of those movies that it was paced well, but it, there were elements that made it longer than it should have been, I thought. But it's also one of those things like, what do you cut out of this movie? Like, yeah. hey, can we cut back on this runtime? Like, this, all the setup, all the building character at the beginning helps with the payoff towards the end. I don't really know what to cut out of this movie, but it does feel its length, and I agree with that. You know what I wanted to say that I, I don't know why I completely forgot to mention it, was one scene that I loved, I think probably my favorite scene in the movie, is when they find uh, Storm and Norman's remains. Okay. I, thought, yeah. I thought that was a great scene and there's, there's that powerful shot where they're doing like the fist bump and yep. you just see the skull and the the dog the dog tag. tag is hanging out of the dirt and then and then the cross i thought that was i thought that was great that was um, a good scene. and you know right before that scene happens you see this shot of the, the vietnamese soldiers sort of popping up in the brush yeah. and then like they're left alone for the next 40 minutes i don't know like because like i was expecting like after storming the, they found the remains like there was going to be gunfire or something. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then you just sort of kind of forget about it. And then they show up in their Jeeps and they're like, give us the gold. I don't know. Back, yeah. I like that, that scene. I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. But what, one more, one more. What'd you guys think of Spike Lee's directing? I, I, I think there was actually, I think it was, re- oh, this is one more complaint I sort of had. I think the movie is well directed. I think the movie is shot really well. It has an interesting style. One of my favorite shots is when David is interacting with all the five bloods and he's like, I want to go. And he's just framed really low, and they're really high. I was like, man, I really like that. Um, lots of long takes. It's not really like a lot of shot reverse shot kind of stuff. It's kind of taken back. There's a lot of switch between stagnant uh, shots and handheld kind of stuff to add to the energy of it. Mm-hmm. Despite all of that, the movie looking beautiful. I thought it kind of looked like there were like the temple set looked kind of like too much like a set, and they didn't really utilize the jungle. I thought to the to their best of their abilities. A lot of times they're in the jungle. It's just enough of an open clearing where they're not too much in the woods. It's kind of like a, it was kind of felt like a waste of potential. Not a bad one per se, because the movie does look good and is well directed. But it kind of just felt like they could have done a little bit more with that. I don't know what you guys think. I, well, the one part they use the jungle well is that flashback scene where you see the, the like the the Vietnamese soldiers. They're like, you know, my girlfriend yep. is yeah. Like you know, they pop out of the grass and they just open fire. Yeah. That was probably the one scene where they did utilize the jungle, I guess, but that wasn't a flashback. Um, and uh, yeah, what what you find with Spike Lee is that he's I this is very evident in Black Klansman. If you end up watching it, um, he holds on to shots longer than um, than you'd expect. He sort of he sort of forces you to be. He's very pro- provocative, and he tries to make you un- uncomfortable at times. And mm-hmm. so you do get these really long shots that can be. Um, I feel like we said the word jarring a lot, but it's a war film, and so it can be pretty jarring. Um, so I think that's just like one of his signature styles, in okay. my opinion. I, I again, um, I, I've 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 seen Black Klansman and I've seen Old Boy, and I feel like Old Boy is not a good representative. Oh, you've Spike seen Black Klans? Oh, okay. I have so seen Black Klansman. remember, remember when they um they go to that uh, yeah that Black rally? Klansman best movie. <laughs> Tyler, remember when they go to that rally and then the speaker has that the the shot on him for like three minutes straight. Is it Topher Grace? I still no, not Topher it. Grace. Um, he's in Kong Skull Island. Do you know what I'm talking about? I watched that in Black Panther in one night. It was a very <laughs> long night of movies, so okay, I, I don't well, remember much of it. You'll know what I'm talking about when you rewatch it. If I rewatch it. And you'll know it, Matt, too, when you watch it for the first time. Ooh. Yeah, I don't know. Any final thoughts before we head on spoilers and stuff like that? Any it's good. I've said my piece. You said your yeah. piece? Yeah. It's, it's a good movie. I, I've been crapping and dogging on it a lot i think it's unsuccessfully what unsuccessfully (laughs) um Um, yeah i think it's a good movie i I think it's one worth watching and especially with how relevant it is now i think it's dare i say an important movie which is a bold title to give it but i think uh it's a well-made movie 
I, I think it's messy. And that's mm. basically it. Yeah, okay, so- then. So we have one more movie to talk about. Well, one of us has a movie to talk about. Tyler, take it away. <laughs> so I watched uh, the new Judd Apatow movie, King of Staten Island. Uh, and speaking of messy movies, oh boy, this one is a mess. Uh, it's not great, but it's charming. So there's this movie. I, I'm not super familiar with Judd Apatow movies. I've seen The 40-Year-Old Virgin. I've, I've seen most of his stuff, actually. I don't know why I said I'm not familiar. That just You've seen, like, Knocked Up. And, You're just uh, a liar. I've seen Knocked Up. I've seen This is 40. Yeah, that's Judd Apatow. That's um, a sequel to Knocked Up. Is Oh, yeah. Um, I've seen Knocked Up. But there's a weird... This movie is not well-directed. It looks flat, and it's not really that funny. And it doesn't have a resolution to it. It's a really weird movie. Basically, the movie just looks terrible. I, I don't... It doesn't utilize anything. doesn't really have any unique things. Basically, all conversations are shot reverse shot, and it gets really tiring. There's also no resolution in the movie. Spoilers for King of Staten Island. But Pete Davidson's arc in the movie is basically overcoming his guilt, um, not overcoming, overcoming his father's death because he died of fire. It's very much inspired by Pete Davidson's life. Well, it is. Um, that and him being a tattoo artist. Both don't really have a clear resolution. The whole point of the movie is him trying to find a purpose in life. And there's this really weird decision by Jed Apatow where uh, they basically are trying to compliment Pete Davidson's tattoo skills. But at the end, we cut to kind of his work, and it's shitty. <laughs> and you don't really – it's like, is that the joke? But everyone's like, wow, it's really good. It's great. You have real talent. And you look at it, and you're like, it's a really shitty tattoo. It's, are those like, Dave, I'm sorry. Are those Pete Davidson's real tattoos? Uh, no, this is, this is when Pete Davidson is tattooing someone. Uh, someone yeah, but the ones, like, on his body, are those, like, his Yeah, real those are real t- tattoos. Really? Yeah. Matt wow, looks, like, shocked. That's unfortunate. <laughs> Um, yeah, but th- there's like it's it has no real resolution because the only character arc he has is he accepts that he has had issues with his father's death. He doesn't continue with a purpose in life. He kind of gets together with this girl he's on and off with, but he doesn't like do anything. And the movie ends, and it's two hours and seventeen minutes long. And you're like, what the hell? Um, there's also weird character changes. Like Marissa Tomei goes from a loving and caring mother to laughing in Pete Davidson's face and slamming the door on him and like that. Um, she also, because her and Bill Burr are together in this movie, they date. She also just randomly breaks up with him when him and Pete Davidson get in a fight. And you're like, and it's just like, it seems like, well, she's basically like, you suck, you suck, you suck, telling him like a bunch of stuff. You're like, whoa, like the scene before we saw you guys were lovey-dovey. Doesn't really make a lot of sense. Um, yeah, the movie just ends. It's also a really dark humor movie and it doesn't always work. I like dark humor. But this one isn't subtle. I feel like Martin McDonough has really good dark humor, um, the Martin McDonough cast. Uh, but this one is very like. Want to spoil anything from Martin McDonough movies before you continue? No, no, no. It's like I just was Martin McDonough successfully implements dark humor, um, and but this movie just is very like it's kind of edgy humor, for edgy humor's sake. Like trying, like trying to be edgy. Yeah, trying to yeah. be edgy, and you're just like, Ugh. like Pete Davidson goes around and makes like a lot of like dead dad jokes, and you're just like, okay, like you're kind of like, just not fun. Like it's not really funny. The thing is though, this movie's very brutally honest, and there's a certain charm to it, um, and I think that's what's gonna draw people into the movie, uh, is kind of how open characters are with flaws and how open Pete Davidson is, and Pete Davidson's really good in this movie. But the standout is Bill Burr. Bill Burr is <laughs> legitimately great in this movie. It's baffling. He is likable. He is charming. And he's a good actor in this movie. It's surprising as hell. Because Bill Burr comes on screen, screen, and he's just, like, yelling at Marissa Tomei. And you're like, oh, it's Bill Burr doing Bill Burr stuff. And then he, like, tones it back. And it's really impressive. I don't know. It's kind of a waste of two hours and 17 minutes. I'll That's how long it is? Oh yeah, my god. Yeah, I was going to watch it because I thought it was going to be like an hour and 45. I took the time. It was like two hours and 13 minutes. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's, that it, is long. And it feels its length too. There's a certain – also, characters just disappear from the movie. His sister is a prevalent part for the first two hours of the movie. Not even. Sorry. Hour and a half. And then she has one scene, and then she's gone from the rest of the movie and never mentioned again. Marissa Tomei sort of kind of disappears for a large portion of the movie. Like, his friends are eventually get arrested for breaking into a pharmacy. They just disappear from the movie. It's weird. It's a 
cobbled mess that's charming. And that's all I can say. And Bill Do you Burton recommend it, Tyler? No, don't watch this movie. It's, a, <laughs> it's, it's overly long. It feels like there's 35 minutes of setup about how much kind of a loser Pete Davidson is. Scale it down to five minutes. Show like two things. We don't need an hour, two hours and 17 minutes about Pete Davidson. I don't know. That's it. Don't watch King of Staten Island. I, I, like, go watch The Five Bloods instead. You're watching – The Five Bloods is 20 minutes longer than King of Staten Island, if you think about that. Mm. That's wild. Yeah. I don't know. Do you guys – no one watched anything else, right? No. no. Nope. Because we recorded very soon. All right, then. So, hope everyone enjoyed the podcast. Yeah. If you made it this far. Yeah. Don't forget to subscribe to new subscribers. <laughs> oh, Matt, we should preface. What are we doing next week? We, I was going to get to that. Thank oh, you for okay. saying that. Uh, we, well, Tyler and I, unless Mark wants to join, are reviewing Ooh. The Marine. <laughs> yeah, Best 2006. movie of all time. 2006? Movie? Yeah, John Cena movie. Yeah. Starring John Cena as John Triton. And so, if you, if you like, uh, if you like good art house discussions like the one we just had <laughs> with The Five Bloods, you can expect it twice, twice the amount of artistic discussion and uh, deep analytical analysis of The Marine. I didn't even know it was a movie that existed until you guys wouldn't yeah, shut up well, about it. You're, you're, you're a loser who didn't like yeah, wrestling when you, were <laughs> in, when you were eight. So. Johnson oh, okay. is young and he's hot in this movie. He's at his peak. <laughs> he's great. No, uh, yeah, we'll probably do that. And then yeah, either Matt will recommend a movie or we'll kind of do – we have another friend who might want to watch a movie, so we might do that. So we'll, we'll figure it out. But, yeah, next week you're, get, you're on Sunday. You're getting the Marine. That's basically it. So yeah. That's right. All right. Let's wrap this wrap this wrap All this right. guy up. <laughs> thank you. Thank you guys for watching. Thank All you. Right. And Bye. goodbye.